when it comes to the global reset, or frankly, any previous governments and central banks resetting of their currencies and creating a massive wealth transfer in the process, frankly, there's always a loophole for those in the know and those in the top 1%. So how would you like to know what that loophole is? To stay to the end of this video and I'll not only show you how the situations in China absolutely will affect the United States, but more importantly, I'll show you which wealth loopholes have existed in the past and which ones still exist today. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading. And today we really need to talk about China because there is so much that is happening over there. And specifically, we're going to talk about real estate and the banks. So there's a lot to go into. Let's just get started. Do you realize that China is moving to stave off a crisis in confidence in banks? And they're seeing that because of the mortgage strikes and the freezes on the bank accounts. I mean, there are so many very interesting things that are happening. And particularly, they are looking to stave off a crisis of confidence. Let's keep in mind that China is the most surveilled and the most controlled population on earth. So the fact that they are looking to stave off a crisis of confidence should be making, I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, when I saw that, I went, oh, this is really interesting because we could be looking at a global revolution. And what did the officials do? Well, goodness, they call for patience. Be patient. Yeah, maybe you're working, you're starving, maybe you're this, maybe you're that, maybe you can't access your bank accounts. Maybe you have to keep making your mortgage payments even though you don't know if you're ever going to get the property. But just have patience. Well, we'll see how much patience the Chinese people really have. The thing that the banks fear most is a run. But what they are doing now and the news that is coming out is sending things in that direction. And I would say that a similar kind of thing is really happening all over the world because they don't want us to think about inflation. They don't want us to to have a crisis of confidence in our central bank, in our government, but the level of confidence is very, very low. So, you know, overall, let's just see what happens. Restrictions on cards does point to an underlying crisis in China's financial system. So people are restricted to deposit only in these particular banks. They cannot make withdrawals or use their cards. The financial system has poor capital turnover and can't cope with demand for liquidity. So let me just remind you that even though it is your perception here in the U.S. or maybe wherever else you are in the world, it's your perception that when you make a deposit, that that's your money. No, 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 it's not. You are loaning the bank money. Make no mistake about that. In the background is the bigger picture of the long-term economic downturn caused by the, the zero COVID policy. So they're saying... But have you gone into the bank and, and I mean, if you do something that's normal, sometimes you can get your money, but have you ever gone into the bank and asked for cash and they said, oh, well, we don't have it here. You have to order it. That is a way of controlling you and controlling your money. What do you mean you don't have it, right? Well, frankly, whether you're in China or you're in the U.S., it's not really your money. And you have to just accept that so that I personally hold some small level of cash outside of the system, but I hold most of my money in real money gold, in good money gold, in good money silver. This fatal blow to the economy results in a loss of liquidity 
that, you know, liquidity in stocks and bonds, it means the ability to buy or sell without having a big change in price. In the banking system, it means without you having the ability to go in and withdraw your money or what you perceive as your money because it's not really yours, as well as making bank deposits fall at the same time. This is a problem because China is in transition, as is the entire world. This is a global reset. It's not just one place or the other. Cash crisis amid China's stalling economy where rural banks freeze accounts, regulators playing past the parcel and bank customers demanding their money. Here's the thing. They staged China's largest protest in years. That is a very big deal from a very controlled economy. The violent episode is the tip of the iceberg of China's looming, they're saying banking crisis, but quite honestly, it's a crisis of confidence and their ability to retain control. A preliminary investigation found that Henan, ex, I'm going to butcher this, Xin Kai Fu group had taken control of the five rural banks through internal and external collusion and illegally attracted deposits from savers. So this one conglomerate, which is a big problem, actually, that's a pro that's a global problem too. But this one conglomerate took control of five rural banks. And here's the thing about that. Even though they must wait patiently, a lot of times, this is everything that the population and that the public has. And you're in rural, you're in rural China. How sophisticated do you think those people might be? Just like here, how sophisticated are most people here? They just make these assumptions. So when they can't get to their bank account, you got a problem. Disgruntled savers of five banks in Henan and Hui provinces have been told they will receive their money, but the official did not provide a detailed timeline. So just be patient. Well, I wonder if they will be. Savers must wait patiently for compensation amid, amid systemic risk, social instability concerns. So Chinese officials are actually really concerned about a banking crisis and their loss of confidence. This is a con game. I don't care if you're talking about China, the US, the EU, Great Britain, anywhere in the world. It's a con game and all con games require confidence. And we've been watching that level of confidence in, in our institutions decline pretty dramatically. And the faster and the hotter that inflation runs, quite honestly, the more quickly that confidence is lost. But what you really have to understand is that we are all inter, incestuously interconnected in the banking system. So this is actually a really big deal and it could easily translate all over the world, all over the world. There's no place that is immune. But the other crisis that they're having at the same time is on real estate, because for governments, whether it doesn't matter where you are in this current system of fiat money, government based debt money, anytime there's a glitch, what have they done? They've just printed more, more and more and more and more and more. And every time they do that, the amount of money out there that's already out there rather loses purchasing power value. But in the real estate sector, China's a little bit different than the U S not a whole lot, but an estimated 70% of the country's middle-class wealth is tied up in property. So that property better keep going up. But what you're looking here, is the number of cities with year over year declines in new home prices. That's this red line. And this goes back to January, 2021. So you can see that their real estate market has also turned, right? And there are more and more cities with year over year declines in new home prices. These are the number of cities with year over year new home price growth. So you can see what's happening. And that's a big problem is 70% of your middle-class wealth is held in a depreciating asset. 
And I'll tell you why in just a second, so stay tuned for that. But China is looking to stem the protests that have flared up at 100 housing projects across 50 cities. So you have these issues with the banks. They have these issues with, uh, with protests on housing projects, uh, threatening to spread the real estate crisis to the banking system in a doom loop. You think? Yes, I definitely do think. The stability of the financial system could be hurt if more home buyers follow suit. This is a growing problem for China because it remains the absolute biggest drag on the economy because quite honestly, what goes up must come down. Nothing goes up forever and ever. And let me tell you, you know, they want you to look at the stock market, which is easy for them to control and manipulate. They want you to keep your wealth in the system because it makes it much easier to take away. And you don't even realize that you're volunteering your work and your wealth. In June, home sales declined 23.4% from a year ago and property investment dropped by nine and a quarter percent. These are some very staggering numbers. China's economy grew 0.4% in the second quarter. I mean, when have you heard of that? You know, China has been the biggest driver of growth for the global economy, and now it is seriously contracting. And, and some of it kind of feels a little planned to me. I don't know. I, I could be wrong. I can't prove that, but it feels like it hitting the slowest pace since the country was first hit by the coronavirus outbreak in two years. Well, you remember how everybody was panicking? And at first, all of those home contracts went away, and then all of a sudden with remote, learn, with remote work, et cetera, then they exploded from there. But when you have interest rates at zero and you have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of free money and stimulus, but again, I'm gonna tell you, what goes up must go down. And that's where the whole world is right now. So are you ready for that? Are you prepared? I, I'm grateful that I've been prepping for so long, but if you haven't started yet, you better get it done. I'm just telling you, you better get it done. She faces surprise revolt from Chinese home buyers on mortgage bo boycott. I mean, I really hope that you can see the significance of a surprise revolt. I mean, this is the most controlled population in the world. And the whole world has been watching China create the surveillance economy with their digital currency, the CBDC, PBOC's CBDC. So for there to be a revolt, I mean, this is a very, very, very big deal. A much bigger deal than anything else that I've talked to you about recently, because this is a huge test. Mortgage boycotts have now spread across 301 projects in 91 cities. So they were concerned about the spread and guess what? You got it, Toyota, you got it. Chinese leaders are facing domestic unrest on a range of issues. I cannot stress to you how significant this is. But Chinese home buyers usually pool the whole family's resources to buy a home. So when those prices go down, it's a life and death matter for them. Okay, no wonder a revolution may be starting in China. The crisis may take a while for you to see. And I say that because Evergrande was the start of that crisis. And that was back in 2017. So then it looked like, oh, well, maybe, not, maybe not a big deal has happened. Now it's coming home to roost. And by the time people know that a crisis is happening, it's too late to do anything about it. You want to get yourself prepared while you still have the opportunity to do it. So many people want to know, well, when? Well, when? It's happening right now. And it always goes slow, 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 right? Slow, slow, slow. And then it's really rapid. And that looks like this is pretty much where we are 
in China right now. It may take a while for you to see, but by the time you see it, it's too late to do anything about it. So if thousands of home buyers believe that their largest asset is in trouble, they could protest as individuals across China and create a systemic political crisis. And this is a country that believes in absolute control. Not directly confronting the national regime, this is how they've handled it so far, has allowed these protests to continue up to this point. From the perspective of the national government, it is probably safer to let the general public vent it out to a permissible degree. So it's going to be really interesting to see where that permissible degree line is. Then suppressing citizens' voices. Well, so they're trying, it's like a boiling pot. And they're trying to let the steam out so that the lid does not explode. Whether or not that's going to happen remains to be seen. But my question is, could we actually see a revolt in China? I mean, do I think we're going to see a revolt here in the U.S.? Absolutely. We're not even a democracy anymore. So, yeah, absolutely, we're seeing growing protests. Could there be a revolt in China? And if there is a revolt in China... Who do you think might be empowered if you're looking at the most surveilled and controlled population? I think this could have, oh, there's no doubt in my mind, actually, that it will have global repercussions. Because it's not just China's home buyers. Would you put that up? Okay. So CC asks, what's that got to do with us? Well, since we are in, and I'm really glad you asked that question, right? We are incestuously interconnected. The global financial system is incestuously interconnected. So if there is a banking crisis in China, there will be a banking crisis globally. If they can cover it up, I don't know. I don't know that they can because China is the second largest economy behind the U.S. and the other. So that's one thing. And the other reason, the other thing that it has to do with us is that if you can see a revolt in the most controlled society, where does that put the rest of the world in terms of a global revolution? And we need to have a global revolution. We have to come together. Because the plans that they have, not just in China, I mean, the whole world, I've been saying this forever, the whole world has been watching how China is controlling their population. So, and, and I love it how they point fingers. Oh, well, that's, that's over there, even though, you know, like when I was driving in this morning, I was listening to them talk about, about China and the population and this and that. And I'm thinking to myself when I'm listening to this, that, that could be, we could take the word China out and, and we'd see that same kind of thing anywhere in the world. So what it has to do with anybody that's watching this from wherever they are in, a, in the world, the world is really a whole lot smaller than you think. And it isn't, oh, well, that's over there and this is here. And so this is different. It's not different. They may be a little ahead of us. They may be a little different than us. And I don't just mean China. I mean wherever else. But the reality is, is if it's happening over here, it's also happening over, over there. It, it doesn't really matter. So it's important to you to see what's happening so that you have your eyes open. And as things evolve here, you can see it. And if that didn't answer your question, let Edgar know and I'll try again. Because it's not just China home buyers that it's also, it's a domino effect. So basically property suppliers are boycotting loans. This is about the, the global banking system. And maybe, maybe I should, Edgar, would you make a little note and I'm going to put the incestuous chart back up so that you guys can see that even though I don't have it in here. But 
Okay, so it's the home buyers. Now it's also the property suppliers because they do things a little differently in China in that you buy the property before it's built. And so you have that loan and you have that and you have to pay on that mortgage. But all of the contractors that are building those properties, they're not getting paid. And so they're saying, well, why should we pay this loan? It's a big problem. Oops. Hundreds of contractors complain bills of bills owed by developers like Evergrande. Some Evergrande suppliers have decided to stop repaying debts. Why should they repay those debts? They're not getting the money. They're not getting paid for what they provided. Widespread. So what we're really seeing here is a widespread, widespread, and it's getting bigger and bigger expression of public discontent. We decided to stop paying all loans and arrears and advise our peers to decline any requests to be paid on credit or commercial bill. So now the banks and investors have put out all of this money to the developer Evergrande in this particular case, but that's true with all of the developers and the developers have taken that money out of the country and they've gone away with it. Evergrande should be held responsible for any consequence, <coughs> excuse me, and any consequence that follows because of the chain reaction of the supply chain crisis. That's another reason why it matters to us because they keep shutting the whole system down with their COVID zero policy. I mean, I gotta tell you, I'm looking around and I've said this before and Dr. Chris Martinson also, we said the same thing. You know, this looks potentially planned because some of the choices, a lot of the choices that are being made are just flat out, forgive me, stupid. They're just stupid. It's like poking the bear. What are you going to do? You going to keep poking that bear? You think that bear is just going to keep you let poking? you know, poking it, or is that bear going to respond and kill you? They're probably going to respond and kill you. So Evergrande should be held responsible for any consequence that follows because of the chain reaction of the supply chain crisis. This is global. I've been waiting for windows forever. How about you? Have you been waiting for windows? I mean, I've been waiting. I think I gave the deposit in January or February, and I don't know when I'm going to get those stupid windows. Some suppliers to Chinese real estate developers are refusing to pay those bank loans because of the unpaid bills that are owed to them. And a sign that that loan boycott that started with home buyers is starting to spread, which was a big fear of the banks and the government that this is now spreading. I mean, I think it's really interesting. The development underscores a dilemma Xi Jinping's government as it grapples with who to bail out. And how do they bail somebody out? Did governments actually go out and work and make money? No, they take on debt that taxpayers are responsible to pay back. So it's pretty easy when you are spending someone else's money. And do I think that's true just in China? Heck no. Look at our government here in the U.S. They spend, I, I'm going to be talking about the Inflation Reduction Act next week, but I, I'm telling you, they spend your money and you really, do you have any say? Not really, you don't. Relief for some borrowers would prompt threats of non-payment by a whole host of others. So it's like a domino effect and as each domino falls, it takes more and more with it. Demands for support could put a strain on state finances. Ignoring them might lead to a spiral of defaults as more and more borrowers refuse to meet their obligations. Do you see this problem yet? Because if you think that that can't happen here, just think back to what happened in 2008. It was a big problem. The central bank is dodging between support for the property industry and isolated acts of pain to curtail the property bubble. And all global central banks are in the same circumstance. They're between a rock 
and a hard place. So even if you look at us here in the US, the Federal Reserve is raising rates. It's more about their credibility than curtailing inflation. And even though it hasn't really shown up in the employment numbers yet, the goal is to create a 5% employ unemployment number because then new employees really have to have that job or your job is in jeopardy. You are not as likely to rock the boat. Forget how much money that corporate heads have taken out of the system. Forget all the stock buybacks and all the dividends and all that garbage that once that money is out of the corporation, you go into crisis, it ain't coming back. Look at Boeing. We've bailed Boeing out more than once and Boeing makes billions and trillions of dollars. But all of those special interest groups get to take that money out of the system and then the investors and the taxpayers are left holding the bag. And I don't care where you go, it's the same thing. And it is indeed a dangerous dance. Absolutely. Because it really is a ripple effect. Chinese real estate crisis risks a bigger economic blow. Banks and governments are both on the hook for property sectors ex excesses. And, you know, let's just kind of put that into perspective because every single time we hit a recession, the response is to drop interest rates, typically five and three quarters to five and a half percent, drop the interest rates to inspire more borrowing and spending. But we have done that for so long that the debt levels are, I mean, they're not unsustainable. They're not payable. And we all know that. And so in something like what we're, what China's grappling with in this particular video that I'm talking about, I mean, you can translate this anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter. When you have that doom loop between banks and the government and the property sector, because the property sector is one of the biggest sectors. Uh, I mean, China, it's, it's outside as outsized as 70%. But even in this country and in many other parts of the world, it's 30% of the GDP. They can't have property values go down. It's a big problem. And there are a lot of fiat money products that are created from this. And they're inside of pensions and they're inside of retirement plans. I mean, real estate and construction make up a big share of urban jobs in China. So that also then puts pressure on you know, on the government to keep that going because they already have 20% unemployment in the younger generation, whether all they have is a high school degree or they even have a college degree. And, and that's another video. They're having a lot of issues around that too. But what I want to talk to you about, and, and I really, it's, it's eye opening is the Chinese government back in 2010, I mean, it really started in 2006 when they allowed the population to buy gold again. And they've kind of put all the infrastructure in. And then in 2010, they started really urging their citizens to buy gold. And gold has a powerful ally in promoting it, the state. Consider a recent push by the Chinese government for its system citizens to buy more gold as an investment. Industrial Commercial Bank of China recently signed an agreement with the World Gold Council. And you know, I use their data pretty regularly on here. Um, do I think that they're really a big proponent of gold? They're too much in the system in the loop for it, but okay. Commercial Bank of China recently signed an agreement with the World Gold Council to help promote domestic demand for gold through new investment products. Like, I don't know, GLD ETFs, where you think you're buying gold, but you're not. You're buying shares in a trust and it's a diminishing asset. But I want you to think about this. China can, oops, China can and will confiscate gold from the Shanghai Gold Exchange which is where most, by a lion's share, where most of the gold of Chinese citizens is held. And they'll do it when it suits, oops, when it suits them. 
By far, the greater bulk of gold owned in China is under the control of the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and they are controlled by the Chinese Central Bank, the People's Bank of China. So that means they have easy access. Should they wish to confiscate their citizens and institutions gold, it can be done overnight. This includes gold held in Hong Kong. And we see Singapore bowing to the will of China in such an event, too. But the big question is, is there a loophole in the rules? Because there always is. So that that 1%, those in government, those in central banking, that understand what's those in industry, frankly, that understand the rules, the real rules, yeah, there is always a loophole. So what is it in China? Okay. Well, the government directly controls the central bank, People's Bank of China. The People's Bank of China owns the Shanghai Gold Exchange. All gold imported in the country, with the exception of gold jewelry. That word exception, I love that word. Passes through or is held in the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The bulk of the gold traded in the Shanghai Gold Exchange remains in their vaults. If you don't hold it, you don't own it, and perception means nothing in a court of law, and it certainly means nothing to the Chinese government. Gold withdrawn from the SGE goes to the banks primarily. There is now an interbank market with the SGE, allowing the banks to hold their gold within the SGE, which offers the biggest and only gold bullion in market. So if you're trading it, you know, I mean, that just gives the government easy access. The Chinese banks are an integral part of the Chinese gold market and lie under the control of the government. So it's all controlled by the government. While owners of gold jewelry are outside of the government's control, they would be more than likely to hand over their gold to the banks acting as government agents should the government require them to do so. Well, I would say that most of the population, I don't know, that's where this revolt really comes into play. But would most of the naive public do that? Mm -hmm. They did it in this country in 33. Yeah, I would say that they would do that. But what do you think about the 1% or those people that are in government or the PBOC understanding the rules? Are they going to turn in their gold? Jewelry, I mean, their jewelry? Maybe, but more likely, maybe not. The fear of an obedience to government is considerably higher than any other large nation on the planet. I think that if they do indeed do a gold confiscation, I think it will be a global confiscation so that there's really no place to run. You gotta know what the loopholes are. And you know, history can help us in that. Because the above confirms what the People's Bank of China officials said when they stated that China owns gold through its people. Now, where do you think most of the gold that, of the few people that own gold in the US, where do you think most of that is held? How about IRAs that are, the gold is actually held in depositories. You don't hold it. So really all you're doing is playing on the price, but how easy is it for the government to do a sweep of those IRAs? Because I can't say this enough. If you don't hold it, you don't own it, regardless of what your perception is. And the central banks and the governments and the traders use perception management and manipulation to nudge you in the direction that they want you to go in. They would much, much, much rather that you hold your wealth inside of the fiat money markets because then, you know, they're, they're going away anyway and they're taking all your wealth with it. 
But if you were in China, what kind of gold would you want to hold? Me? Give me my jewelry, which I know I'm not wearing any today. Because frankly, there's always a loophole. Always a loophole. You just have to read the fine print. So you know where else we can experience that? How about Executive Order 6102 requiring gold coin and gold bullion and gold certificates to be delivered to the government? Thank you very much, Mr. Roosevelt. Section 2, all persons are hereby required to deliver on or before May 1st of 1933 to a Federal Reserve Bank or a branch or agency thereof or any member bank of the Federal Reserve System all gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates now owned by them or coming into their ownership on and before April 28, 1933, except, I love that word, except the following. Gold coin and gold certificates in an amount not exceeding the aggregate $100. And remember, gold was $20 an ounce back then. So five ounces of gold belonging to any one person. And here's the other exception. This is the one that I like the best. Gold coins having a recognized special value to collectors of rare and unusual coins. Why? Because Treasury Secretary Wooden wanted to continue to accumulate gold without oversight, kind of like the jewelry in China. And so he wrote that caveat in that enabled him and his friends that understood this little exception to continue to accumulate and hold gold. Like my Uncle Al. I mean, you know, if, if I've, I've said this before. I know that I have been grim for this moment in time. And we may not realize the experience that we've had in the past that put us into a position to understand it in the future, but this is definitely one. Because in 1965, he had two floor safes probably at least 3,000 ounces of gold when it was illegal to hold more than $100 worth or five ounces. And he probably had 3,000. And because they were having a recognized special value to collectors of rare and unusual coins because they were minted prior to 1933, he got to use them if he chose to in the normal marketplace. What he held was legal. Just like those in China, if they're sitting on gold jewelry, that is legal. And durian confiscation could well be the exception. In the U.S., the exception were the pre-1933 coins. That's why that's all that I buy when it comes to gold. Silver's a different story, but that's all that I buy when it comes to gold, is I buy those that fall into this classification because... Personally, I, I do believe there's going to be another confiscation, and I think it could quite possibly be a global confiscation. We've seen so many coordinated efforts of global central banks. I don't think this is going to be any exception to that particular rule. So therefore, it becomes really important to figure out what are the possible exceptions. And history... You know, you got to look back at history to determine what is the most likely outcome in the future. I think that this is the most likely outcome. And I always try to do, what if I'm right and what if I'm wrong? And I want to do what doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. You know, I'm going to be good. So by buying gold that I absolutely 100% know is severely undervalued and that they're going to reset the intangible fiat money against, give me that kind of gold. That's what I want. That's why I only do the pre-33 collectible coins. So there you have it. There's always a loophole. It's important to know what those loopholes are so that you can stay within the legal letter of the law and use it as you need to, as you choose to in the coming reset 
where those opportunities lie. Now make sure on Thursday, make sure to watch my boots on the ground interview with my returning guest, Jeff from Bulgaria. I mean, he is very close to what's happening. He's part of the EU. Bulgaria is part of the EU and he's near the Ukraine and, uh, and Russia issues. So you want to definitely watch that interview. It was great. And I'm so appreciative for him coming on and helping us understand this. Also make sure that you subscribe to our beyond gold and silver channel. Every week I'm taking the mantra, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, uh, community and shelter. And I'm showing you examples of news headlines and why these things are so important. So come on to our gold and silver beyond gold and silver channel and make sure that you subscribe. And if you haven't put your strategy in place yet and you haven't fully executed it, click on that Calendly link below, set a time to meet with one of our consultants and get your strategy in place and execute it. If you've started it, but you haven't finished it, get it done. Can you see that things are heating up? We are in, the lull before the storm, don't get caught in that storm. So if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, share, 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 because ignorance doesn't make anyone immune. It just leaves everyone vulnerable. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.